Welcome to the special summer edition of The Open Educator, the best place to be on a Saturday morning. Thank you for joining us today and for taking the first steps to grow personally and professionally. And today is a day and a guest you do not want to miss. And I would like to encourage anyone who has a camera to please turn it on and to listen with intention. The Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program here at USF develops students in three main ways. One, of course, we help students develop businesses and create uh, and change the world of how we live. Two, we help students become entrepreneurs or those who are innovating in companies. And today's guest will talk about his experience working for innovative companies and how to transition from uh, maybe jobs or careers and, and different industries. And lastly, we define help students define careers they define themselves and not what others define for them. And I would suggest our next guest who has a career path that they've created themselves and have utilized many tools and techniques to get where they wanted to be today. So Stenio, I would like to welcome you for being here today on this Saturday morning. Our first Google member, someone who I've known since 2006, and I've always been impressed with your career, what you're doing, what you're learning, and constantly pushing the boundaries since our days of, of, of our class at University of Chicago. So where does this cast find you, and can you bring us up to speed on what you've been working on? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning to everyone. Uh, right now, I'm in Austin, Texas, uh, and I just moved here February this year. So I'm one of the many people that are coming to this crazy real estate market, and I joined Google a, a month ago. And before Google, but you had a career and met a few different areas that helped you launch into the, to the, we'll say Google universe or working at Google. So some of the things that maybe the student, MBA students might be interested in it is about your career path, how you got where you are today, and maybe some tips or some highlights of your journey. Maybe you could share a bit, you know, where you came from and, and the progress that you made over your career. Sure. So throughout my career, there was a theme of technology. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil and I graduated in computer science in 2003. Uh, I worked as a software developer in Brazil for the following three years. And after that, I came to the US uh, around 2005 to work at my parents' company. So it was a, a small family company, smallish. It had 20 employees and had reasonable revenues. And the idea there was to start with technology. So I was doing websites and things like that. But as a small company, I started being exposed to different areas of the business, marketing, sales, uh, product packaging, regulation, logistics. And I worked there for seven years. I had a H-1B visa and eventually I got the green card. So I, I wanted to open my wings and try different things. And for one or two years, there was the struggle to position myself in the market. I wanted to keep this technology core that I had, but go more into business. And that was a struggle until eventually uh, in 2000 and. 17, I want to say, I joined a consulting company where I was doing technology and the execution, but more on the architectural side, so more high-level implementation solutions. I worked at that company for two years, and then I moved to a different company called HashiCorp, which is the one that I was working before Google. At HashiCorp, I worked for three years, and it's a company that has a portfolio of products, software products, that help companies do digital transformation meaning uh, moving from hardware, from physical locations to the cloud, virtualization. And in that company, I brought my technical skills, but also I was doing sales, pre-sales. And that's how I joined Google uh, this year in this pre-sales uh, area where I'm bringing my technology expertise and I'm explaining to prospective accounts how we can help them uh, innovate and move to more modern solutions. I think you're mute. Wonderful. Thank you for that brief summary of your tr career transition. So I'd like to just go back to what you started with, because in fact, I know at least one of our guests on our show right now 
works for a family business. So we often, sometimes we have a misunderstanding of career paths. And then the students who are working with entrepreneurship or innovation and these concepts, they might think you either start a business or you work for a company. And what I'm hearing through your journey, there was this working for a family business. I'm wondering how that experience helped inform your experience working for a larger company and maybe helping them or the customers that they're serving. Because it sounds to me that these aren't exclusive paths, but in fact, they support each other in your skill development. Right. Yeah, it was very critical for my professional development. Uh, I would say that working for a family company, there are the benefits and the drawbacks. The benefits is that uh, potentially you get the opportunity to be exposed to different areas of the business, like in my case, logistics, marketing, sales, technology, where traditionally uh, you wouldn't have access to those areas. So that's awesome because it get, gives you a greater overall understanding of what it takes to run a business. But on the other hand, the drawback <laughs> is if you decide to go back to the corporate world, it's kind of hard to explain this uh, great experience you have had in a way that's uh, understandable for the recruiters. So how do you brand yourself as a candidate? How do you position? What was your expertise? Uh, there was a, a big struggle that I had for a few years uh, trying to navigate the, the, the recruiting universe. So, yeah, I had the great experience in marketing, sales, in, in logistics. But how do you translate that to something that's easily digestible for a recruiter that's just looking for something specific? So while that question was made specifically to answer the question, the value of of your experience at the family business as it relates to the corporate, other individuals on our cast work for, we'll say, a, a government institution or some uh, public institution and may want to transition or expand their, their reach. And I know you have a history of, if it's continuing education, of course, your MBA at Booth and even uh, certification. So I'm wondering, did those, those other tools help you move or transition or get more exposure even while or after you worked in the corporate world? And if, if you can give maybe a couple of examples, if those uh, are relevant in terms of how you, you journeyed in your career. Sure. I don't think there's one single uh, certification or one single solution that's going to help you achieve what you want. In the end of the day, it's going to be a combination of things. Uh, in my case, uh, what I have done is I set a goal. Well, I set multiple goals and I try different things and then eventually one of them worked. But uh, what I would recommend is if you're working in one area, government or family or even corporate, and you want to transition to something else, establish this goal uh, and then do some research. What are the skills required for that particular position that you're looking? What's happening in that industry? What are the trends? Who are the competitors? Get yourself immersed in that reality because it's not going to be immediate. It might take uh, at least six months, a year. So once you get yourself immersed, strike start to identify what are the gaps that you have. Uh, are there certain certifications that the recruiters are looking for in their job postings? Is there a certain knowledge that you're missing? Uh, are there certain events that you could be attending and networking? Uh, have you tried to reach out through LinkedIn to people that work in that particular company that you want to work? Uh, can you tap into your network? So it's a combination of different initiatives that you can take uh, in order to reach that final goal. So yes, yeah, certifications do play a part, but it's just one more um, uh, tool that you use in this group of uh, things. You're mute. I'm curious to know which certifications have helped you the most and maybe if you know that since you're working at Google and there's certifications at Google uh, that they offer, is there some, since you do have a wide range of both certifications, um, uh, training, formal education, is there something that you see being more relevant instead of this dogma or dogmatic approach to say, just get certified and, and get this thing, get this thing, 
And is there are there is there some patterns that you're seeing that has more relevance, or is it just specific to the individual and and their needs compared to the gap that they're looking for? Right. Yeah, I think everybody's aware that there is not a single certification that's the key to everything. Uh, it's going to be very dependent on each individual's career path. But I think before talking about certifications, it's important to put yourself in the recruiter's shoe or in whatever manager's shoe of where you want to be working with or where you want to be and think to their thought process. What are the skill sets that they are looking for? What are the, the things that make their job easier? Maybe to find a candidate having a certain keywords. So once you put yourself, like you're immersed to yourself in that opportunity and you understand what's going on from the other side, you can walk backwards and, oh, so maybe if I had this little title in my resume, uh, it would be easier for them to pick me. But then like doing the interview, doing whatever questions they ask, I, I have to be articulate. So the certification is not enough, like it's one step to get you closer, but you have to have this overall understanding. So my recommendation regarding certifications is this, uh, put yourself on the recruiter's shoe or truly understand what are the requirements of the role and what is valued for that particular area that you have already researched and that you have a plan to go towards. I'd like to pivot a little bit away from maybe the career journey and transition, but to more about the concepts of innovation, because many of the audience members are taking my innovation and DALI course here at USF. And I know you have some experience and you have some unique experience. One, the family, if you could share a little bit about what products and uh, what you were offering in the family run business, and what products and services you were offering in your other experiences. And maybe do you see a certain pattern or you, so you've been on both sides of the fence, both uh, as a builder, a producer, but also trying to get into companies with your innovative products and, and sales approach. Could you share a bit about the experiences that you do have with products, development, services, and innovation? Sure. That's a great question. I don't know if I have seen like a, an overlap between the two regarding innovation, but I can talk about how innovation was uh, impacting in, in both opportunities. So when I was working in the family business, it was a consumer goods company. And in that company, what innovation meant was understanding the market trends, what the consumers were looking for in those particular products, what kind of marketing keywords they were looking, what kind of uh, websites or influencers they were following and extract that information, try to apply to new product development. So we would work with different factories so they could produce uh, the new products using those insights. Uh, one example that I can give, so it was pet treats like for dogs and cats and natural was a big thing. It still is, but it was like at the start and certain categories like uh, deer antlers and things like that. So how can we incorporate maybe deer antler flower to our products, which is something that wasn't available in the mass mer merchandise uh, for pet treats. So that kind of thing, understanding the market and bringing those insights to our products. That was in the family business. Uh, in my mo more recent corporate uh, IT sales job, it's a little bit different because it's software. So in that regard, yeah, I deal with all this crazy machine learning and going to the cloud virtualization. So those are all great and very interesting and they can be very impactful. But since I'm in the position of selling these to established organizations, I always have to be conscious of the human factor. So it's not enough just to sell this fancy new artificial intelligence. You have to understand that there are people that have built their careers uh, doing things that they are doing until now. And you might be proposing something very disruptive. So uh, you might sell that to your main stakeholder, but you have to help them reduce the risk of, uh, is it actually going to be adopted? So when you sell this very innovative solution, you have to consider cultural change. So unfortunately, I haven't seen an overlap on the two, maybe because I'm very focused on the tactical, but on the family business was extracting marketing insights to the new products and currently uh, understanding the human factor of this digital transformation. 
So I, what I do want to highlight is while we're in, in the course of innovation at Ali, we talk about many frameworks for innovating and the family business uh, example that you gave, you were trying to exploit trends. You didn't know the cust end customer directly, or you didn't necessarily have access to the end customer since you were a B2B business. And therefore you were trying to ride the coattails of these trends and to try new things and, and play off of these broader attitudes and perceptions of the market. Where I hear you say in terms of the service uh, innovation or the application with the, the technology, mm -hmm. you're dealing with uh, an individual, of course, at the corporation, but also their organizational culture, the challenges that they faced for adoption, the individual needs that that person might need faced in their, in, you know, personally, but also professionally. And I think this is also relevant for my students because they have these challenges. They might try to pitch an idea for an adoption of, of an idea or a product or service or process, even within their firm. And therefore they have to take in the cultural, the, the individual, the humanistic aspect. So I think these are all very relevant. Plus we're getting to highlight the different frames or uh, models that we have been talking about in, in the class. I'm hoping that you can expand a bit more. I know you said that you've only worked at Google for a month, but what role does innovation play? Because it's they are always a case study. They're always at the top of the mind of being an innovative company. In your first month, what can you say about the role innovation plays? Maybe if it's closed or transparent or open or I mean, Salesforce, we've had last our last guest was um, from Salesforce and they talked about how it's tied to Ohana and the, the community and and the KPIs. Have you gotten a source of the role that innovation plays throughout the organization or is it just lip service at Google? <laughs> no, it's not lip service. It's one of our core pillars. I was just in a class. Uh, there are five pillars. Uh, one of them is innovation. I'm sorry, I forgot the other ones. But uh, what I have been exposed so far, yes, Google is a very innovative company. Uh, the dimension that I have been exposed is uh, open communications. So Google has Google, everybody knows, uh, but we have our own internal Google. It's a search engine that you can search anything, people, projects, uh, calendars uh, in the same page. So this is amazing because it gives you visibility, for example, in the calendar of other people, like here in the Austin office, because you can imagine a company with 350,000 people around the world, there's a lot of things going on, like a lot of different interest groups that are getting together, different communications, different projects. So now I'm trying to learn like the skills that I need for my job, but also how can I take advantage of this sea of opportunities? So it's very easy to have access to the different groups, uh, see the different events, and I think that's a, a, a factor of innovation because it allows people to um, understand what's going on and to contribute, like uh, naturally gravitate towards the areas that interest them. In my case, security and blockchain technologies. So I have access to all of that and it's very easy to reach out to those teams and they're very open. And at Google, there's the 20% where you're allowed to take like a portion of your work time to invest in that kind of initiative. So it's very exciting because I can see myself uh, in the next two, three years, I'm not going to be doing the same thing. Gradually, I'm going to slowly be uh, aligning myself with these things that really interest me. So I think it's beneficial for the person uh, because it allows you to control your career progression, but it's also beneficial for the company because in this sea of 350,000 people, uh, gradually people start to cluster together in the topics that uh, interest them and that they can provide uh, value. So there's a sense of openness or transparency. And I'm wondering if your if your other experiences at other corporations also have this idea of openness and transparency and or if it's different, how did the cultures or how are the cultures different? Because if organizations can be they have this legacy closeness, which is something that we talk about in our organization, in our, in our in our business, in our class, and then we talk about the other alternatives of openness and transparency, or open innovation and other open models. You know, how do they? How you've experienced these? I mean, I know other students have experienced maybe 
variations of these, but are there are there differences and how did it empower you or how does how do you see it empower the employees and or what were the challenges from from your brief experiences in, in these two dichotomies? Sure. Uh, before talking to that, just a disclaimer, a caveat that maybe I'm seeing everything still with rose tinted glasses because it's my first month and I think Google is amazing. Maybe I'll change my mind <laughs> in a year. But yes, uh, in two other previous companies that I worked, there was the talk about innovation and open culture. But uh, I had a sense there was a lot of politics involved and it wasn't so easy to navigate the different groups. Like you can't go directly to one group because maybe your manager would be upset. It's like, oh, why are you talking to those people? Like we should be doing our business here. So there wasn't this incentive to uh, uh, provide value. Like even if it's not for your direct work, even if you're not being measure it's not part of your targets I, I want to help those guys in security because i think it's very interesting so in google it's very open in other companies i felt it was more restrictive because of politics like there were little silos and in those two companies uh it, it wasn't common like to cross the silos and actually participate and engage with other teams that are working in different initiatives like here is very open and easy so that's one of the biggest challenges organizations have to unlock the value of and creative and innovative forces of their employees is because of these silos. I would imagine Michael might see some of this. I imagine David might see some of this. These silos, these legacy institutions, uh, processes and, and then organizations that then inhibit or maybe discourage. How did you work around that type of environment and to to grow personally and professionally maybe to practice some of this openness was there any methods that you use because i know that my we're all facing this and we want to drink the water that helps us become more engaged throughout the organization and, and maybe help the organization change in their culture do you have any tips or ideas how you navigated that right i think there are some companies that have some innovative workflows like uh the um What's the, the shoe company that was famous for that? They had a, that Amazon bought. I don't know, like a shoe company that was famous. They had this process called Holacracy, uh, where uh, there was an incentive for the different teams to get together in a more informal way and align into groups of ideas. And everybody had a voice in that discussion. So there's there were lots of little rules to allow everybody to participate. So maybe explore those different uh, workflows, frameworks that are considered innovative and understand those and maybe bring to, to your company, say maybe to HR or to whoever um, can have an impact of internal workflows or company culture and propose that to say, hey, uh, I attended this presentation, somebody said something interesting and I was doing this research. What do you think, like, would it be possible for a company to start adopting this? Could we do a pilot uh, of where we can bring together different people from different areas of the company just for a brainstorm or just to uh, share what they have been working? Maybe it's something that you can do once a month, like on a Friday and everybody does a pitch of what they're doing. So I think this is a great opportunity for you, like an attendee of this meeting, to have the initiative to reach out and try to come up with some solutions and bring to your company and see if you can adopt. Because that's one way to grow professionally. What are you bringing to the company besides just the basic stuff that you're expected to bring? Like, how are you accomplishing more? So that, that would be my take on that. Wonderful, because we're still looking to build these toolkits and these skill sets so we can make an impact right away or make these small changes from the ground up and make a, a groundswell within our organizations because it can be suffocating if you feel that you can't be open or you can't reach across boundaries and you can't work on. So we as MBAs need to take that initiative, which is uh, one of the, the you know ideas of, of learning and going for your MBA is, is to have the practical skills, which I hope uh, this course and our courses uh, provide that.
Yeah, and my last point on that, just make sure to bring these um, suggestions with empathy, understand the other people's side, like maybe they are tired, they're bored, they're already like overworked, and it's like, oh my God, like this person took one class and now they think they are the wizard <laughs> coming up with these crazy ideas. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you as a person, as a professional to build your executive presence and awareness and try to identify the best way to communicate these suggestions without just, oh, hey, like I saw this amazing thing, like we should change right away. Because I saw that when I was going through the MBA and trying to bring those insights to my family company. And I was very frustrated <laughs> because according to the classes I was thinking, we were doing everything wrong, like everything backwards. And I was trying, no, we should do this, we should do this. Eventually, after a few years looking back, I understand that we had different dynamics, a different reality than what those classes from the MBA were teaching. So things weren't just black and white, like there was a lot of gray and being able to navigate that gray was part of the success of this small family company. So be aware of those things, like if things are not exactly how they are presented in a book or in a nice framework, try to understand what are the reasons for that, if there are any reasons, or if it's just lack of knowledge. Because uh, I think it's better to start with the assumption that whoever is doing their job knows why they're doing the way that they are, and there might be some things you're not aware. So use that as a learning opportunity. But don't let that make you afraid, like be willing to take that initiative. On that same path, before we open it up for questions, because I know Michael, David, and Ricardo have lots of questions for you. But you went to Booth, you went to a top uh, MBA program, and I want to know what in your program did you take most, because you just spoke about, all right, we present content in a way that's a, a framework or a very perfect model, but the reality is trying to apply that to each different context may need some modification adjusted and knowing how to do that or what are the variables that may impact the change or best make that change for that change. But I'm ask, want to ask you, what was the greatest takeaways or what advice would you have for current and future MBAs to make sure that they get the most out of their MBA? And is there some things that, that stand out in your experience uh, as you went through yours? Uh, sure. I think from my MBA at the University of Chicago, I had three main takeaways. Uh, the first one is that title that you can put in your resume, which for my career progression, to be honest, <laughs> I haven't really used it. didn't make a difference. Like uh, I have been hired in the past two companies because of my skill with these very complicated technologies. So the MBA is like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> but I do understand that for other career paths, having that title in your resume is important. So that's point number one. Point number two is the network of people that I have met. And I have made true friends. I was surprised. Like I changed my uh, job on LinkedIn and people were reaching out from the time of boot and they actually worked for LinkedIn. So it was great because when you do an MBA, you're exposed to this network of other professionals that hopefully are similarly as invested in their career growth. So you might work with them throughout the program, but you might see them again in five, 10 years. So at Google, I'm happy to know that I have acquaintances in different areas. So if I want to explore those areas, it would be much easier. And the third point that I would say, it's more uh, doing the MBA gave me a greater understanding of the different career opportunities out there. And I was particularly interested in strategy consulting. So I invested my time in researching and learning about that and preparing for the interviews. So I think preparing for those case interviews was very relevant. And in the MBA context, I had access to different people that are going through the same preparation, uh, the same tools. So uh, it was something that just by myself, perhaps I wouldn't have access to that. So those three things, like the little title, uh, the network of people, and being exposed to the different uh, corporate career trajectories that you can take. Before opening up for questions, you talked about you have experience with artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we hear a lot about that's the future. We're going to all lose our jobs maybe, or it's gonna help us be more productive. 
or there's efficiencies. What is unsexy about AI and machine learning or what needs to be said that isn't being talked about? Well, I think it's two things. Uh, first, that it's not magic, uh, especially machine learning. Uh, the way that it works is uh, an algorithm that operates recognizing patterns in data. So if you don't have good data to start with, to train this model, like you're not going to have good pattern recognition. So th this would be point number one, just to demystify a little bit. It's not like something out of this world, like from Mars, like it's just a computer algorithm that recognizes patterns and you have to train it. And the second thing that I found very interesting at Google uh, is as I learn about the uh, artificial intelligence solutions we have, uh, we are advised that before selling certain uh, aspects of the product, there's an um, ethical panel that we have to validate with them uh, if it's okay for us to sell the artificial services services uh, to that particular use case. And I believe that happened because uh, if I'm not mistaken, in 2018, uh, Sun Jar. Pinchao, uh, the CEO of Google, did a presentation where he was showing the uh, voice AI, where live on camera, he configured the application to call like a, a hair stylist and make an appointment. And everything was done live, this whole conversation, but he wasn't typing anything. Like the computer was doing the call and scheduling everything and responding to the person on the other side of the line. Something very exciting. But afterwards, there was uh, a bit of a brouhaha because, oh my God, what is this? We don't feel comfortable. So because of that, Google created this ad tech panel. And just today, this morning, I was reading, there's the new movie about the, the cook guy, uh, Eric Baudin, I guess. And there's a little controversy because a few of the scenes were created with uh, artificial intelligence. Like they took snippets of him talking and they, they created this whole sequence of uh, artificial uh, presentation, narrative from him. So people are a little bit uncomfortable with that. So what Google is doing is that there's this ad text panel. So those are the two things, like dismystify what artificial intelligence is and that uh, at least Google is responsible. And I think other po companies are being responsible on the ethics of the applications. My question to you would be, is it only is Google being ethical or are there other ones, other big tech companies who may not have the same ethical North Star? Because there's a lot of discussion on the some of the abuses or ignorances that some of the big tech, particularly Facebook, is doing. I mean, uh, for business, there's two drivers. There's uh, money and there's regulations. So even if they want to be unethical, in the end of the day, they might be liable for uh, regulation or, or they might be there might be litigation. So they have to prepare in advance. So even if they want or not to be ethics, it's something that they are required to do in order to reduce their risks. Uh, I'm just being exposed to Google. I don't know enough about what other companies are doing uh to 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 talk about it i do invest in palantir uh, i think palantir is a company that's doing um, uh, pattern recognition for some use for some governments so i feel a little bit conflicted about that but to be honest i haven't researched enough to to be articulate about it interesting so i'd like to open the floor up for questions from our audience i know there's uh, some um, of you guys who are raising your hands Go for it, Michael. Hey, good morning. Thanks for your time. So uh, going back to you, where you mentioned that Google's got the 20% uh, rule on innovation, uh, I'm just wondering how that's applied and how do you personally find the creativity to work on projects that interest you? And then I guess furthermore as a follow-up, how does Google throw resources at new innovative ideas? So for example, if, if I'm an employee and I come up with some idea that needs a small amount of R&D. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Google decide what to invest in? I would imagine with a company that size, there's a million ideas. And so unfortunately you can't invest in all of them. So how do they prioritize and review that information? Or is it just like my own little mini network? If I work at Google and I've got to find my own developers that can back my, my 20% 
uh, plan until it gets large enough and you know we can scale it. All right. Uh, thank you for the question. I'll ta tackle the second part first uh, regarding how uh, to get resources or how to get alignment around a certain idea. So I have limited exposure, but what I have seen so far is at least two things. Uh, number one, Google has, uh, from what I understand, like an internal department. There's a name like Project X or something like that, where people can pitch like a, as if it were a startup idea. Uh, and maybe they, they write a business case and it's evaluated by a panel. So then they, they'll probably assign resources. And one of, uh, there was a product called Chat AI. Um, or there was a different name, but eventually this graduated to actual Google product. So this one that Sunjar was uh, showcasing uh, relies on that. So it's an example of an idea that started as somebody just had this idea of automating uh, call center uh, solutions. They proposed, uh, it grew internally, and then it graduated to its own product. The other thing that I have seen is centers of excellence. Uh, I was looking for blockchain, people interested in blockchain or groups or employee uh, uh, groups or something like that. And I found out that they created a blockchain center of excellency in 2018. And from my understanding, it was a group of people that got together and they presented to a more director level and they got a, um, a sponsor to sponsor the center of excellency. I don't think they have funds invested, but at least it's something more formal that they can structure. And it could potentially be the start of a new direction that the company takes. So it's a combination of having structure process and more um, autonomous, organic process that happens when you are able to get uh, people with similar interests together. And once again, this goes back to the open communication aspect. Uh, regarding the first part of your question, uh, the 20% and how do I dedicate my time? Uh, I think I, I'm still too new at the company. I was just sharing with Steve uh, before the call that uh, part of my onboarding is to take some certifications because Google has hundreds of products and I'm supposed to be articulate when I'm selling these products. So one way of guiding my studies is to get those certifications. So what I'm doing in the mornings, I'm saving one hour, like after I do yoga, play guitar, <laughs> I study for these certifications. But it's also a little bit self-driven because I do understand that this is going to give me the skill set to grow professionally uh, to where I want to reach my goals. So right now I'm focusing on these basic certifications, but I'm also studying about security and studying about blockchain. So once again, it it's not it still requires the individuals to have their own initiatives and their own interests google just allows like this space that maybe other companies won't have this degree of flexibility if i could piggyback off of that there's a few famous cases or uh case studies on innovation from google and an example would be so what what Stenio is mentioning is a a few different models that we talk about in class. Certainly, the wisdom of crowds. This also this openness, transparency, the role of culture, etc. But for instance, we now, or most of us, or many of us, have a Gmail account. But in fact, what they what Google is famous for doing is having this open forum where people can present or pitch ideas, and if they get enough support as they prototype it and develop it with their twenty percent time. They build awareness, they get some sponsors, they're starting to make some small uh, momentum. The people who started Gmail said, they didn't. this was prior to Gmail being invented and created, they said, we can do better than AOL and, and, and yahoo.com. So this is how Gmail started. And I assume there's many other products like, like Stenio had mentioned. So they built this you know, through their 20% time, they got some resources. And after it reaches a certain um, level, of, of acceptance or approval, who are, the, just think of it this way. First of all, this is wisdom of crowds and collective intelligence, but second of all, it's using this intermediary or platform type where the client, it can be a bottom up approach to innovation and where knowledge is dispersed and that could aggregate into a new product or service. But think of it this way, who is best to 
determine the potential success of a product if especially if those same people are the ones who are going to be building it servicing it implementing it selling it right so if the people within google see google gmail being superior to the other products that they're using you could see that they're build you know they're already adopting it they're, they would be a form of early adopters before it becomes mainstream and or pushed to the market. So that's a great example. Another tool that they've used is this idea of a prediction market. And while I don't go into the specifics is uh, in our course, it is a form of, of collective intelligence and a way of, of predicting certain things. Uh, the success or sentiment of, a, of an idea, so sentiment of a, of a project, et cetera. So there are different ways that they're evaluating. It's through this value of transparency, using these different platforms, the assumption of bottom-up innovation, dispersed knowledge to come to a better solution that have ultimately driven top-line revenue for, for Google. And Stenio has come up with a, a few different examples. So these are wonderful uh, examples. Thank you for sharing, Stenio. But you yeah. can see it's, it's also like you have to have some processes and it's not just a free-for-all, but you also need top-level support through the sponsorship, but you also need the bottom-up approach where people feel engaged that they want to give and that they believe can make change. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And just to, to finalize, um, we are talking a lot about Google, but as uh, maybe next week you start researching different companies, different ideas to perhaps bring to your organization or uh, to start thinking about, uh, besides Google, uh, 3M is another company that has a lot of innovative practice internally. Uh, the shoe company that I was talking about is Zappos. <laughs> so they're the ones that have holacracy. And one I just uh, got acquainted recently is JB Hunt. Uh, they're not that famous because they're a private company. They're in logistics. But they are like, I don't know, uh, $100 billion? It's something ridiculous. And what I have heard is that even though they're in logistics, which traditionally is a legacy industry, they are disruptors. So they're always trying to find different ways of changing their products. So uh, I, I can't share too much confidential information of what they have been doing with Google, but it's another one to, to keep in mind when you're looking for innovative companies. Wonderful. I'd like to open the floor for questions. David, yes. Yeah, good morning. Thank you for your time. I uh, appreciate a lot of the, the insights that you've shared with us this morning. Uh, my question is not very, very complicated. It's more just curious. Um, since you're just starting this job at Google, and obviously we're still kind of in the midst of the pandemic, just uh, wondering, you know, what their kind of work remote policy is. I know a lot of companies in the, in the tech space like Twitter have gone, you know, told all their employees they can do permanent remote and just curious to see what Google stance was. I also know that uh, Austin is the new tech hub. So I don't know if they want people in the office there. Or, yeah, right. so. yeah, thank you for the question. And I think that's a very interesting topic because I keep getting notifications on Twitter of people complaining about Google. Oh, it has two measures. Now they want us to get back. But uh, whoever, like there's a very high level individual that now he's moving to New Zealand. <laughs> And he's the one that was pushing for work from the office, but he, he's the exception, apparently. So there's this external controversy. But the people that I, I, I have more direct contact uh, in my sales organization or people here from Austin, everybody is very excited to go back to the office. And I personally, I'm excited for the free food <laughs> and it's closed from here. But my understanding, like I said, is that there's going to be the official reopening in September. It's still being defined, but the expectation is that it's going to be a hybrid model. So you're expected to be at the office certain days of the week and other days uh, you're off. And at least in the Austin office, uh, it's going to be, you don't have an assigned table, assigned desk. Uh, you reserve the, the desk in advance. So those two things, like externally, there's a, a big like brouhaha about Google being inconsistent. But what I have seen internally is people are very excited to be back in the office, uh, but that the expectations that's going to be a hybrid model. I guess just to kind of piggyback, and I know you've only been there a month, but I'm, I'd be curious to see 
how they feel the creativity and innovation happens in a remote setting versus a collaborative setting. Because right? that's always been the big sales pitch, you know, throughout history, right? You put people in a building and uh, ideas just happen, you know, due to human interaction um, that, that I think it's hard to quantify in a virtual environment. Yeah, I think that's part of the argument of uh, having the physical location still as part of the strategy. Uh, maybe you don't start with the idea, but just the connections, like the people that you see every day in the morning in the elevator, or you go to the micro kitchen and you say hi to somebody. Those are opportunities to build your network and to share ideas. Um, and not only that, yes, uh, remote works, but uh, I agree with you. If you're in a room, like there's a more free flow of ideas uh, because you can get the nonverbal communications, uh, maybe when you're opening the door, like something's mentioned, and those are experiences that you can't replicate uh, remotely. I, I would push back on that if, if we can have this dialogue with all of us. Of course, maybe if you agree that there's a trend to digitization and technology, you know, you're, if you believe that, then you are also suggesting that there's a lot of things that you can do through digital technology and digitization. But if you suggest that there's, you know, uh, certain things can't be done through digitization and technology, then you're almost arguing against that trend. I know while this is not completely black and white, um, you know, it, it may break that argument or break that trend. So you, you can't necessarily have it both ways and we don't necessarily know what tools, technologies work in what setting and we're still working on that. But it, I'm still feeling that it's naive for organizations and leadership to think that, oh, only creative things can happen in person while the rest is all the world is going digital. You, do you see what I'm saying? So there, there's a paradox in what we're saying and what we're or saying two different things and, and maybe even executing depending on the organization. Does anyone feel that way? Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead, but so with me, it's, it's kind of, I'm caught in the middle because in my current role, I'm working at a company that I've worked at for almost four years. So I have a certain level of comfort and I know everyone and that makes that kind of digital collaboration a lot easier. Whereas I'm kind of thinking, you know, once I get this degree, I might be transitioning to a new organization. And in that situation, I think I would definitely value going into the office and, um, you know, starting to just kind of immerse myself in the culture. Because I think that's something that's a lot easier to do when you're in person, in front of people, um, you know, basically growing your, your new network and, and learning the way that, you know, those processes happen in a different organization versus what you're used to. So I think that aspect of it is definitely um, easier in person than it would be online, but I don't have a lot of experience starting a new, a new position at a new company online. So, um, you know, maybe somebody else would have better insight, but that's just my personal take. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, what I would say to that is, um, you're, I agree with you, you're probably comparing apples to oranges here a little bit, because there's, there's definitely a degree of interaction in a, in a virtual environment than a physical environment, but um, uh, my opinion, and I have no experience in this, so I don't really, I'm not a subject matter expert, but I think you would wanna create an environment that gives you the largest number of opportunities to occur. And so the, the question is, is what would solve for that? And if you put, you know, 10,000 people in one building that, uh, you know, you'd have a lot of opportunities for interactions to happen. Um, but there, I'm, there's certainly ways to do that in a virtual setting. Um, I think that we've done, and there's probably new ways that we don't even know about, you know, that would create innovation, you know, just by having that environment to come up with new ideas on how to accomplish those goals. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think in the end of the day, it's about being a realist, being aware of what are the benefits and drawbacks of remote and benefits and drawbacks of being present. And uh, you just take the best of what it works for different uh, scenarios. So I think uh, 
there are the drawbacks of requiring physical presence that people have to commute, there's a waste of time, it's not as efficient, uh, maybe people have families and they're outside their families, so that's a big drawback. But then there's the, the benefit that you're in this environment that can uh, enhance collaboration. And on the remote perspective, it's much more flexible and easier and more efficient, but then there's the drawback of losing this human connection. So that's why I appreciate what Google is doing with this uh, potentially hybrid approach where we'd, we would take the uh, advantage of what works best. I'd like to open the floor up for one last question from the audience before I, I pose my final question to, to Stenio. All right, I go ahead, Sia. Okay, I was just gonna say, um, what is a challenge that you had to overcome that you have just looked back on, whether that's recent or in the past, and you're just really glad that you overcame it? Uh, I think it was the Google interview. <laughs> <laughs> I was very concerned about that, and I prepar prepared like crazy. Um, so uh, just, just briefly, the, the interview process is four different interviews. And part of the challenge, uh, it's myself, like I'm not very spontaneous. I like to prepare way ahead so I can be fluent. For example, I didn't know the name of the Google guy that's in New Zealand or the, the name of the cook. So I have to memorize those things and be prepared. And part of the interview is that they're, they are looking for your thought process, not only your uh, domain knowledge, but also your thought process for resolving problems. And uh, that's one of the things we have to practice those frameworks. And the other thing they might ask you questions, oh, tell me about a time in your career where you had to deal with conflict. Like, I don't remember. So I had to prepare like all those different stories. In the end of the day, it took me three months uh, to prepare for that. So I think that was one challenge that, that was very glad I got over it. And that just goes to show how effective your preparation was. So that's yes. cool. <laughs> I'm happy you mentioned the role of spontaneity. One of the courses that we offer here is Improv for Business. And it's a thematic-based approach where we believe that the foundations of being a good improviser are the foundations of being a good uh, leader and a good team member, and even a good human being. And spontaneity is one of the themes that we learn and practice these soft skills because as you know, or we know, in the MBA, we learn a lot of hard skills, but you're suggesting one of the greatest challenges that you've had is part of the soft skill interview process. And it's not anything about you. It's certainly about how we educate and where we value certain skill sets. So in fact, I'm giving a shameless plug for the Improv for Business course that we offer. And I know a few of us have taken it. But uh, thank you for sharing that role of spontaneity. If you wanted to get better at being more spontaneous, then you, how, how would you do that? Um, what a difficult question. If I wanted to get better, uh, I guess I would take your class. <laughs> Improv, <laughs> spontaneity. <laughs> uh, well, I guess uh, spontaneity comes with being aware of yourself, uh, being able to be authentic and have uh, an overall game plan in mind, like what do you plan to accomplish at the end of the day? So don't focus on the little ideas or specific words. Like for example, I don't remember somebody's name, but I understand the whole concept that I want to explain. So have a focus on the high level and have uh, awareness of yourself as a professional and what you can bring to the table. And have fun. Wonderful. So we talk about play, we talk about fun in that class, we talk about the role of storytelling, which is your overarching point and context you're trying to make. This idea of not focusing on the details, but relating it to something that you already know related to the broader game plan. These are all uh, thematic approaches that we learn in the Improv for Business, and we can see right here why these soft skills are, are important. Stenio, I can't thank you for enough for joining us this morning. One last question that I ask all my guests. If you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you give him? 
Um, I think formalize the framework that I have been using so far, and the framework has three points. Uh, the first one, set a goal. The second one, be kind to yourself. And the third point is be understanding of others. So that's the framework that I follow for my life. Wonderful. I love how much we're talking about understanding others, understanding our customer, understanding the organization, understanding empathy. These are all soft skills in humanizing the organization. And for those who know, you know, management, much of management structures have come out of other organizations or other uh, contexts that were very different, the military or different frameworks and assumptions about the individual. So I'm very happy that we're talking about humanizing management, humanizing innovation, and all of these soft skills that we need to have in order to be better leaders, better innovators, better creatives, and just better workers. So Stenio Ferrara, I'm very happy that uh, you joined us this morning. Uh, Stenio is a customer engineer, application modernization at Google. Uh, Stenio, how do students reach out to you if they want to continue to build their network, which was a, a very valuable aspect of your MBA? and also a very valuable aspect of their MBA. What advice do you have for them or how to reach out to you? Uh, sure, it can be my LinkedIn. Uh, I think there's only one Stanio Fajeda at Google. <laughs> and uh, Twitter, I post some technical links, uh, Stanio123. Wonderful. We'll check back in, in a few months with you, Stanio. And again, thank you. Can't thank you enough for, for joining us this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the questions. Bye.